Today I'll be talking to you about bacterial isolate and plasmid sequencing. So I don't need to tell you about all the roles bacteria play in our lives, not only in outbreaks of infectious disease, but also in our health, our human microbiome, and the microbiome in our environment. Not to mention industries like biomanufacturing, biopharma, or foundational molecular biology research that rely on key workhorse organisms like E. coli, for example, to amplify plasmids. And I also don't need to tell you about the amazing advantages of nanopore sequencing for these workflows. We've had some fantastic talks at this session describing these. Um, as recently as last year with our Q20 plus chemistry, we've seen that we can achieve Q60 or near perfect de novo assemblies of bacterial genomes and their plasmids. But we didn't see this for every strain. Some strains were lower, even sometimes closely related strains of the same species. So today I'll be explaining to you why this happens. It's due to methylation. I'll show you how that works, and I'll explain how we tackled this challenge in two different ways, one through base calling and one through consensus polishing. Together, these bring you to workflows you can use today that provide more accurate, more robust, more consistent, near-perfect bacterial genomes. So let's dive in with some basics about how methylation works in bacteria. So there are three main modifications that we see commonly, all methylations. That's 4MC, 5MC, and 6MA, as shown here. There's much fascinating biology for how these modifications are used that I don't have time to get into. For today, we only need to know three things about methyltransferases, the enzymes responsible for adding these modifications. The first is that they're sequence specific, so they bind to and methylate a particular sequence motif, whether it occurs on the chromosome or on a plasmid. Second, they're extremely diverse. So the Rebase database at this point has tabulated over 12,000 of these genes that recognize over 3,400 unique motifs. I'm showing you just a couple examples here. They can be symmetric and palindromic. They can be short or long. And I'll point out GATC and CCWGG here um, as they're quite common across strains, including common laboratory strains of E. coli, for example. The third thing to know is that these genes are highly mobile. They can move between strains or clades through horizontal gene transfer. What that means is closely related strains of the same species can actually have quite different methylation patterns, and very distantly related organisms can have similar methylation patterns. So Brownia already nicely introduced the way that modifications impact the signal in RNA. I'm going to show you the same thing in DNA with some real data. So here I'm showing you an overlaid plot of a number of reads from a particular region in a bacterial isolate, in this case from PCR data, unmodified. So I've warped these signals in time on the x-axis and also normalized them on the y-axis so you can better see how they correspond to each other. In addition, I'm showing you these thick black lines. That's a prediction from a simple model for the signal level we expect to see for that sequence of canonical bases. It's not perfect, but you can see that it works pretty well. And the sequence is annotated at the bottom. Now let's overlay data from a native sample from the same region in blue. We can see here there's perturbations to the signal around the known location of the 5MC in this motif CCTGG. Now, as we mentioned, the base caller's job is to identify the canonical sequence of bases. It then passes this over to the modification caller to classify modifications. So the base caller has a tough job because modifications can cause different types of perturbations in different sequence contexts. And if we're especially unlucky, the modification can actually make the signal look similar to a different sequence of bases. So I want to show you one example. This is the same isolate, but a different motif, GATC with a 6MA. Now, if we look at how the base caller behaves when calling these reads, we see that it makes the same mistake relatively often. So in 18% of the reads, we have an A substitution at the G position of GATC. These are all on the forward strand next to the 6MA, and this is not present in the PCR data. So clearly it has something to do with that 6MA. But why is it calling an A substitution? I've shown that sequence here in red. We can use our simple model to predict what signal levels we would expect for that sequence, shown as the thick red lines. What we can notice is that the deviations between the black and red lines are actually not at the 6MA position, but in the context, um, even outside of the motif itself. In addition, if you look closely, you can see the blue signals are slightly more consistent with the red sequence than they are with the black sequence. What that means is the effect of the 6MA is a similar effect on the signal to an A substitution. And so the base caller makes this mistake more often than normal. So I want to emphasize, it's not that the sequence of bases here is unusual or unfamiliar or difficult because PCR data looked great. It's also not the case that GATC or 6MA is unfamiliar or always difficult. 
there's tens of thousands of occurrences of GATC in this strain, and only a tiny minority show this issue with the A substitutions. Instead, it's the interaction of the mod, the motif, and the sequence context around the motif that conspire to create a particularly difficult example for the base caller. But just because it's difficult doesn't mean it's impossible. There's plenty of information there in the signal. With models that are higher capacity and that have had more practice, we can see huge improvements. So in this case, our V5 models reduce the substitution rate down to 7%. And I'll note that this model has not seen this particular strain in training. So how do we teach our base callers to deal with these difficult problems? We take a multi-pronged approach of different data types that balances showing a high diversity of examples while enriching for the most difficult ones. On the high diversity side, we can randomly incorporate modifications into PCR data from an arbitrary template, giving us maximum sequence context diversity. In the middle, we can take synthetic DNA, again from an arbitrary template, and treat it with a specific methyltransferase enzyme, like the one that methylates GATC. That enriches for difficult motifs while keeping that high diversity around the motif. Finally, we have native isolates, which are chosen sparingly just to supplement for some of the most difficult motifs. However, over time, we work to reduce um, the use of these in favor of the other more diverse data types. And all of this is underlined by a strong foundation of validation data, a large collection of strains that we hold out from training, the vast majority, in fact, held out from training, so we can test the model's ability to generalize to unseen patterns. And here I want to give a special thank you to the Nanopore community, who are very proactive in um, giving us access to data that you guys sequence from all sorts of cool organisms. It really does help us um, to develop and test our models. So where are we now with the V5 models? We can see that we've increased our accuracy in a wide range of motifs. Here a collection of about 30 strains. I've shown all of the motifs. We see that the V4.3 and V5 models in blue show improved per base per read accuracy in these motif regions across nearly all of the motifs. And that leads us to increased accuracy in the consensus sequences as well. So in this strain collection with the V4.3 model and further the V5 model, many, many more strains are now at Q60 or near perfect assemblies. But we're not stopping there. We can do even better by improving things in how we generate the consensus sequence. So consensus is the first step in many workflows. We want to assemble our reads together, polish the consensus to remove any errors, and that gives us the finished consensus we'll use for all sorts of downstream analyses. Now I want to highlight here two of our most popular epitome workflows that follow exactly this process, one for bacterial genomes and one for plasmid validation. So today I'm going to be talking about this consensus polishing step with a tool called Medaka. Medaka is a neural network model that's trained to polish or remove errors from the draft assembly. Now, Rudy is going to talk about this in much more detail next. So very briefly, I'll just say it does this by aligning the reads to the draft consensus in a pileup view and passing that to the neural network. So it sees the information kind of like we would see looking at a genome browser. Importantly, it sees many reads at the same position, and it can see reads on the opposite strand that don't have the modification. So in principle, it has all the information it needs to very effectively correct these strand biased errors from methylation. But in practice, models that we've released in the past haven't seen as many difficult examples in training, so they were not very consistent at this task. We've rectified this. We're now releasing a new Medaka model for bacterial methylation. We've improved training and validation, similar in spirit to what I mentioned for the base caller. And this leads to um, a market improvement across a wide range of motifs. Here we can see that even on top of the V5 base calls, we improve even more strains up to Q60 by just polishing the same assembly with the new Medaka models. In addition, we can look at another collection of strains. This is from a preprint with strains that were chosen specifically to have very diverse and unusual modification motifs. None of these strains were used in training, but we see improvements across all of these motifs. In particular, I want to highlight here, the new Medaka model is compatible with multiple generations of base callers, including V4.2 and V4.3. And what we see is that as the base callers improve, the Medaka model provides an additional improvement on top of each one. And with both of those improvements together, we've brought down the consensus error rate for almost all of these motifs. I also don't want to forget about plasmids. So in plasmids, we're often thinking about two particular motifs, GATC and CCWGG, as I mentioned, that are common in E. coli. Um, and so we also see this Medaka model provides significant improvements in these particular motifs. 
This is looking across a set of 14 isolates from 10 different species, not just E. coli, that have these same motifs. And we see really robust and improved performance with the new Medaca model, again, across a wide range of base colors. So how can you guys try this out today? So we're very excited to announce that this new Medaca model is released in both of those two epitome workflows I mentioned for bacteria and for plasmids. So we highly recommend using epitome. It's simple and easy to use and provides really rich uh, downstream analysis information at your fingertips. And they always incorporate the latest advancements from the machine learning team. So both of those new versions are out now. In addition, if you'd like to try Medaca out standalone, if you download the version two that was just released and use this flag dash dash bacteria when running consensus, it will automatically use the new model if it's compatible with your base calls. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.